Hello and welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 224 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 80 of A Storm of Swords, that is Sansa 7. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information about the characters and other things of note in this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing all right. It's the uh, it's Molly's fourth Wednesday of the year, so... You know, actually, we did have a we did have a, a pretty big milestone this past Saturday. Her last her third Saturday, of the year. yes, her her last competitive swim meet, Molly's. Uh, I don't know oh, if I okay. said Molly or not there, but yes, Molly's last competitive swim meet, and that one hit me pretty hard. That it really did. I, uh, you know, it was senior, it was it was conference championships, and it was also senior day so they honored all the seniors and they there's a big poster of her and you know they called the seniors out one at a time and gave them flowers and they walked across the the pool deck and there's a big thing that says congratulations seniors on the uh, on the jumbotron there and uh yeah i just you know she started swimming when she was five started swimming year round when she was seven and they hundreds of probably more like thousands of hours that she and I spent either at a swim meet or at swim practice or me sleeping in my van while she was at 6 a.m. swim practice or up at four o'clock in the morning me carrying her down the stairs it, it, to get her to a swim meet that starts at six o'clock in the morning you know it just uh, came and went. I will say that you have you have invested a ton of time in her swim career, and that 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 must be hard to come to the end of that because yes, it was. It is different because she hasn't swam year round for the past two years, but she still swam for the high school every year. You know, so I got a little taste of it. Her times, you know, there was never any like that anticipation of excite of excitement of how is this swim gonna go? Is she gonna you know, when is she going to best her, you know, get a new best time? Is she going to get some sort of sectional standard or something? That kind of went away when she stopped swimming year round. It just became, you know, just cheering her on. Yeah. But still, it all came to a crashing end. Hey, she, she, uh, her very final event, she swam in a re- relay with one of her best friends and they won the relay. So, you know. Okay. It's, well, that's uh, good. It, it ended on a high note, I guess. Yeah. So we had our sustainer call yeah. yesterday. It was yes, a we lot did. of fun. Yes. And uh, I I gave them a, a taster of this particular story. But um, my wife's aunt, Allison, came to visit from Florida. And I, I hadn't seen her for a while, several years, pre-pandemic for sure. But I thought it was like four or five years. My wife tells me it's been more like 10 to 12 years since I've seen Alice. Ah, uh, that so, happens. Time, time flies yeah. when you're having fun. Time flies, exactly. Uh, and I'll admit that I did not rush home to see Alice. And I like Alison just fine, but I have work to do. And I knew Alison was going to be around with my mother-in-law and Carson. And I was like, let, let them have their time together. I don't need to impinge on this. Right. But I hoped to see her. And... <laughs> Sometimes God pats you on the head and says, good boy, Simon, and gives you exactly what you're looking for. As I was arriving home from work, they were leaving. I was like, that's what I was looking for. Perfect. I got to see her. Yes. Didn't have to hang out with her. Perfectly timed. But I got out of my car and she was on the other side of my car. And I said, hey, Alison. She said, who's talking? She didn't even see me. So I walked around the car and saw her and I said, hey, how are you doing? And she said, Good grief, you've gone grey. <laughs> Not good to see you too. It's good yes. grief, you've gone grey. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I got. That's what's happened to me in the last 12 years, apparently. <laughs> you've gone grey. <laughs> apparently. Well, there's worse things uh, to have gotten, I guess. Well, 
the other thing, actually, the compounding evidence for Alison being correct and not just mean spirited. Um, I was reading in bed the other day, as one does, as one does, as, as the civilized do. Yes, and uh, I was struggling to read the book. I, I think it was my phone, but it may have been a book. It was one or the other. <laughs> um, my bedside lamp is not terribly bright, and so it's not the easiest to read anyway. So it must have been a book. Yeah, it was a book, because I couldn't really read it. And I tried putting my glasses on. My glasses are, are very focal, so I'm supposed to wear them for everything. Right. But I've never worn them for reading, because my reading is perfectly fine without them. Was, anyway. It was much better <laughs> yeah, with like, the glasses. I had a hunch uh, that's where you're going with that. <laughs> uh, so uh, there we are. I tell you what. Well, and, and as you can see, but luckily the listeners cannot, I have a band-aid on my face because my dermatologist hacked a piece of me out today as well. So if you're listening, kids, wear sunscreen always. Uh, yes, I sure wish I had uh, started doing that about 30 years earlier than I did. Yeah, it's, uh, it's right there. It's like a quarter of an inch below your left side of your lip. Yeah, it was just like a pimple. It wasn't a big deal, but she was like, let's just take a little sample of that just to be sure. Uh-huh. I, I compared her to a serial killer who likes to take sort of mementos of uh-huh. patients. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to take a bit from this one and a bit from that one. <laughs> but I like her a lot. She's she's very nice, my dermatologist. So I don't begrudge her her mementos. Yeah, I, I can't remember if I mentioned it on this uh, on our uh, podcast here, or if I've ever... It f- felt like you had other podcasts on the I, burner. I, then, I, I was going to say on a podcast or at lunch, but I think I've mentioned it before that uh, the first time I went to my dermatologist for um, a spot on the top of my head, kind of like at the, uh, I don't oh, know, yeah. the top back of my head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the dermatologist looked at it and went, I'll be right back. And went and got her boss, like the head derma, the dermatology doctor of the practice. That's <laughs> like, oh I, boy. I like I like head dermatologists, like yeah. not, either the chief dermatologist or the dermatologist of the head. Right. Yes, the the, the chief head dermatologist. Maybe it was, she was. Uh, and I was like, uh, everything all right back there? And they're like, hmm, what could this be? <laughs> Get the camera. <laughs> Anyway, we do have a really long chapter, uh, a lot of d- to discuss. In that case, let's get down to business. Yes, let's How do How did we leave Sansa Stark? Last we saw of Sansa, she and Littlefinger had arrived in at his ancestral home, a desolate small keep in the Fingers. Littlefinger gave Sansa a cover story as his newly discovered natural-born daughter named Elaine. They were met by Lysa Arryn, and Lysa and Littlefinger were promptly, very promptly, married. After the wedding feast, Marillion made unwanted sexual advances on Sansa, but Lotha Brune ran him off. The next morning, Littlefinger introduced Sansa to her aunt, revealing Sansa's true identity. Lysa seemed kind enough to Sansa and hoped m- to marry her to young Robert Arryn. McKelly, why don't we get the summary of this one? All right, and of course, this summary comes courtesy of Jenny of Oldstones. Thank you, Jenny. And as Jenny does, she titled this one, Only Cat which will make sense when we get to the end. Okay. Sansa awakens in her bedchamber in the Eyrie, momentarily forgetting where she is. She had dreamt of when she was little, of sharing her room with Arya and Winterfell. Her existence at the Eyrie is lonely, with only her aged maid and little Lord Robert for company. Lysa too is lonely. Her household is small, and Littlefinger is at the foot of the mountain most days. Lysa has taken to doting on the singer Merlion. She's banished two serving girls and a maid for telling tales about him. I have a feeling that those tales were true. No. Get out. I just a feeling. Okay. Well, we won't jump to conclusions. Uh, most of the mountain lords resent Littlefinger's marriage and his position as Lord Protector of the Vale. Jan Royce is close to open revolt over Liza's failure to join Rob's cause. He has the support of many houses as well. The Mountain Clans are making matters worse by being particularly troublesome, and Lord Hunter has died so suddenly that his two younger sons are accusing his oldest son of murder. Sansa realizes she's not going back to sleep and goes to the window. It's snowing outside, and this is the first time she's seen snow since she left Winterfell. She remembers her happiness that day and how she felt that she was beginning a new life, but looking back, 
she feels as if her life were ending. Sansa dresses and goes to what passes as the godswood for the Eyrie to enjoy the snow. She starts to make snowballs, but has no one to throw them at, so she starts using them to build a castle instead. After a while, Sansa realizes she is building Winterfell. She notices people watching her intermittently, but no one stays for long. She has trouble with the bridges until Littlefinger appears with advice, and they finish the castle together. Sansa flings snow in his face as they finish. Littlefinger quips that the act was unchivalrous, but Sansa replies that so was making her believe that she was going home. Littlefinger admits that he played her false, and then he kisses her. She yields for half a heartbeat, but pulls away in outrage. As she's protesting, Robert Arryn enters and begins to knock down her castle, pretending his rag doll is a giant. Sansa reaches for his arm, but grabs the doll instead, ripping the head off. Robert cries and shakes, flailing violently. Mesa Coleman arrives and sedates Robert with dream wine. Sansa spikes the doll's head on a stick and mounts it on her castle wall before stalking away. Back in her bedchamber, she wonders if she'll be banished and thinks she would actually welcome it. Life would be more exciting at the gates of the moon. She contemplates telling Liza she won't marry Robert. Then Marillion knocks at the door and summons her before Liza. She wonders why he's acting as a guard. Marillion closes the door of the high hall and locks the guards out. She thinks she is going to be punished for causing Robert shaking fit, but Liza is in a rage over Littlefinger's kiss, thinking Sansa is responsible. Liza rants about Catelyn's treatment of Littlefinger when they were young, often leading him on and teasing him. She mentions a specific time when Cat danced with him six times, then rebuffed his advances. He drank and passed out afterwards, so Lysa comforted him. After having sex with Lysa, he called her Cat before falling asleep. Lysa thinks Sansa is trying to steal Littlefinger away like Cat did. She thinks of how Littlefinger was sent away, not because of his duel with Brandon, but because he had gotten Lysa with child. Liza was tricked into drinking tansy tea and having an abortion, and then married off to John Aaron. Sansa apologises for kissing Littlefinger, which only enrages Lysa more. She insists Sansa accompany her and goes to the moon door, making her niece look down at the vast emptiness below. She pushes Sansa to the edge. Marillion sings while Sansa is shrieking in the midst of Lysa's sobs and rages. They grapple with each other and the guards begin to pound on the hall doors. Littlefinger appears from the back entrance. He tries to stop Lysa, but she is delirious with rage and grief. She screams that she's the only woman who has ever been true to him. She got him his first post. She killed John Aaron at Littlefinger's request with tears of lice. She even sent the letter to Catelyn regarding John's death, which was Littlefinger's idea too. Peter finally talks her away from the edge and gets her to release Sansa. He admits he's only ever loved one woman. Cat. He shoves Lysa out of the moon door. Marillion looks shocked and horrified. Littlefinger tells Sansa to let the guards in. Marillion has just killed his lady wife. Only Cat. Wow. So... Stunning end. So this is the last named chapter of the book, right? So this is... Yeah. I, when I saw that Sansa was going to be the last named chapter of the book, I was like, what? It's kind of anticlimactic. How wrong I was. Because that is a climax to a book. Yes. So uh, much going uh-huh. on in this chapter. S- Lately, I mean, just in these past few, Sansa chapters have really been spilling all the tea lately. Uh-huh. <laughs> the tansy tea, if you will. Lie, uh, little figure confirming to Sansa and to us that it was Olena Tyrell that poisoned Joff last uh, Sansa chapter. And then literally confirming that the tea, the tansy that uh, Hoster Tully kept, uh, you know, kept saying while he was dying was actually in reference to the tansy tea that uh, ended. Uh, Liza's pregnancy with uh, Littlefinger's child. And now we learn that uh, Liza killed John Aaron on Littlefinger's instruction and then intentionally lied to her sister Kat about the Lannisters being the ones that uh, killed him. So all this yeah. in the past two uh, Sansa chapters. Yeah, I did her a disservice. 
she's delivered the goods, says Sansa. Yes. So, taking it chronologically, we first get sort of a political update about life in the Vale. The lords aren't happy. Uh, both, they were never happy with Lysa's decision not to get involved with the uh, the war. And that's th- compounded now by Littlefinger's new role as Lord Protector of the Vale. House Royce is... Uh, near revolt and because they're such an influential house many of the other lesser houses are following them um yeah and that's something that liza alluded to last sansa chapter she she told littlefinger that yon royce is stirring up all sorts of trouble demanding i call my banners and go to war and as i've been as i thought thought about it this chapter especially because it comes up again that um yon royce is near uh, in revolt over Liza not backing Rob in the war, and I, I thought it's a, that's a bit surprising. You know what connection does Jan Royce have to the Starks? And is this a question, or are you? I, no, you know it is a question. I mean, Ned fostered at the Erie. So, that's what I was going to say. You know, right. so Ned Foster at the Erie. So, so presumably they knew each other. Yeah, it, it could be. Also, that they're, maybe, they're roughly contemporaries, right? Maybe John Royce is a little bit older. Yeah, yeah, his children are older anyway. So you right, think he's yeah. he's a bit older, but you know, maybe John Royce believed Stannis's letter about the incest, you know, more than the average lord, and uh, or, or just thinks that Liza sh- should support her family, and that got me thinking. Maybe it's not the Stark cause that he is so passionately wanting to back. Maybe it's the Tully portion of the war that he is wanting to back because Brendan Blackfish Tully was the Knight of the Gate for many years yes, in yes. the Vale, and he's a well-respected knight, so possibly the Vale Lords developed a connection with him during their years in the Vale together. I'm I'm going to say you've got a point there that that definitely influences it. The other thing might be that he might quite understandably blame the Lannisters for the death of John Arryn. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else seemed to think that, that it exactly. Was. Everyone seems to think it was them, and uh, you know, so so he lost his liege lord to the Lannisters. Why would he take their side in the war? And also, just one other thing, I think sort of martial lords like Yon Rice want war. They need it. And the Vale is sort of like the one area of the Seven Kingdoms where you can really avoid war if you want to. You just stay home and don't yes. do anything. Right. And he probably has the sort of like desire to get involved in war almost on any side just to be doing something. Yeah. I had never thought about it that way, but yeah, that makes some sense. It's very yeah. It's very opposite of the Riverlands, where the Riverlands gets drawn into almost any Absolutely. conflict because they're stuck in the middle. <laughs> no matter how peaceful you feel, you ain't going to be able to stay peaceful. Yeah. Yes. But one other little bit of news that we get is that Lord Hunter died suddenly, so suddenly that his sons are fighting over who, uh, whether it was the oldest son's doing, that, that he possibly was murdered. And I just thought real quick I'd remind everyone who Lord Hunter is, in case you're thinking, that name sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't remember. I'm not even thinking that, McKelly, but I'll take your... <laughs> well, so elderly Lord Eon Hunter, E-O-N, I get, I, I'm thinking it's Eon Hunter. Yeah. Uh, he was in attendance for Tyrion's request for a trial by combat, and he was also in attendance for the actual trial itself. He, during the... In the high hall, when Tyrion demanded a trial by combat, he, he actually, offered to fight. Yes, he offered to be. He was one of the many that stepped up to be Liza's champion, assuming it would be Tyrion that that they would be fighting. Right. Uh, he was described as being older than John Arryn and seriously crippled by gout. So uh, you know, it's no major shock that he suddenly yes, died. Yes. This this Lord Hunter died suddenly at his age. You're gonna die, you know? right? so i don't know maybe there's more to it but it certainly seems like he was old and not healthy so him dying suddenly is not the not a huge shock so for me the early part of the chapter is all about sansa coming to the realization that all her life she'd been dreaming and searching and hoping for something you know to be swept off her feet by some prince of uh, uh, legend 
uh, but that she'd had what she wanted all along that winterfell was home that she was that when she was there she was surrounded by love and she's lost that ever since she left and it's kind of heartbreaking for her to have that realization yes yeah she uh, as she puts in and jenny references in the summary she puts it in the um chapter that she thought her song was just beginning when she the day she left Winterfell, but really looking back, it feels like her song was actually ending when she was leaving Winterfell. She's probably thinking that right now, but in actual fact, right this moment, she, the world's her oyster. You know, more than more than most of our characters. Oh yes, she, she, right. She, her story could go in many many different directions from here. I also wondered if that sort of like that thinking back to her time in Winterfell might constitute some foreshadowing of her resolving to get back there and reclaim it. Now, I don't know if she's actually going to do this, but she is Ned and Kat's second child and right. therefore has a claim by primogenitor, our favourite word, right. to Winterfell. But uh, since the realm and she also believe that uh, Bran and the other one are both <laughs> dead... She actually is literally in line to the throne, right? To to, uh, to Winterfell. So, so I wonder if you know her becoming wistful and wishing to be back at Winterfell is actually sort of like going to lead her to well, you know what? I'm actually going to go back to Winterfell and rebuild it. Yeah, you know, maybe that's part of what caused her to say to Littlefinger um, that it was unshiverously done that you said you were taking yes. me home and in fact you took me to the Erie, which is not at all home right which which of course she wanted to go home but he he made the valid point that you know what was home for her it was destroyed and that nobody she loved was there right so. yes yeah i guess it's good that john didn't take the uh the offer to become john stark lord of winterfell if Sansa's think, well, think, thinking the same we, thing, we don't know that that's not going to happen. Still, I mean, he could be, he could issue the Lord Commandership in favor of uh, warm the warm walls of Winterfell with Val in his bed. <laughs> well, that's true. He he has not officially declined it yet. Maybe Stannis <laughs> will up the ante. <laughs> he's he's going to stand on the wall and throw a stick over it for ghosts. Why don't you <laughs> clear up? <laughs> So she heads to the godswood, or what, what passes for a godswood in the Eyrie, and she notices a statue of a weeping woman, broken, fallen on the floor, half buried. You know who that is. How well, do you know who that is? Yeah, it's a, so it's the statue of Alyssa Aaron. And, and the reason we know what it is is because the fact that it's broken on the ground is because Bronn pushed it over on Servardus Egan during the trial by combat for Tyrion. That's what ultimately killed Servardus was uh, the statue being pushed over on him. So that's why there's Man. a broken statue in the uh, garden here, or Godswood. Which I had we completely call forgotten that. That's I why I thought totally I'd mention it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's a TV influence thing because I've pictured the battle going on in the, in the throne room. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I could see that being a problem. Can I just say a quick bravo to Sansa for her castle? The most complex thing I've ever built in snow is like a feeble snowman. Like, <laughs> like, n nothing like as good as you see in real life. Um, so it sounds like really good snow, like perfect, you know, sort yes. of like, you know, clumping snow. That's going to come back in uh, pedantry, let me tell you. Okay. But... Uh, but I'll just say, I was working in daylight when I made that feeble thing. And I had the help of modern fabrics to keep me warm. So, <laughs> seriously, kudos to Sansa for building this castle. Yeah, I guess that's uh, you, you grow up in Winterfell and, you know, making yeah. snow castles is uh, what is you do. she is a child of summer. I mean, yes. yeah, it snowed occasionally, but... That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, one thing we uh, we get here is the second half of a Ghost of High Heart prophecy. Oh, go on. Well, so... This, I'll give you the whole prophecy. This was from Aria 8. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. Now, we discussed that as... We thought that that was her hairnet. Yes. That had uh, poison in the, in the purple jewels. Exactly. Now, here's the uh -huh. second half. And later, I dreamt that maid again, slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. 
Huh. So we've got Sansa building a snow model Winterfell, and then Robert yep. comes along pretending to be a giant and mm-hmm. smashes it. And then Sansa accidentally rips the head off of the stuffed doll that Robert was using to play the giant. Uh, does that feel like an oddly minute detail about Sansa to put in a prophecy? <laughs> yes, it does. So therefore, you might also think it may be a foreshadowing of something bigger along the same lines. Yes, maybe. sure, sure. But yes, I mean, it certainly fits. It does. And... You know, we had discussed the last Sansa chapter, the idea that Littlefinger being the stone giant looming over everyone in Bran's dream from way yeah. back in A Game of Thrones. She's also currently in a castle covered in snow, being the Eyrie, with a man whose former house sigil is a giant. Now, she doesn't slay him. It's Eliza that goes out the moon door. <laughs> that is a question for the end, though, because because Baelish has gambled a lot. He's shoved Lysa out the moon door. And, my God, Sansa's going to be grateful for that because it was, you know, almost literally one or the other. But Peter yes. Baelish is then going to pin it on Marillion. And that's fine. Nobody really cares about Marillion. <laughs> In fact, some of us actively want him to die. But... <laughs> If Sansa sees Peter Baelish as a rival slash tormentor, she has a golden opportunity to rid herself of him. Because when those guards come in, Peter Baelish is going to say, it was Merlion. And Merlion's going to say, it was Peter Baelish. And the guards are going to turn to Sansa Stark. Right. One more person was in the room. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Sansa, take your pick. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, that that could be. It, it would certainly be a, a much more uh, impactful prof- uh, part of a prophecy, you know, than, than just True. this scene in the garden here. Uh, but winter is coming, and she has many more giants to slay. Yes, yes, that's true. There could be so many more giants in her future. Exactly, yeah. And, and one thing I'll, I'll add real quick is that Littlefinger asks Sansa if he can come into her castle. And if that sounded slightly familiar it it's because it's the name of a popular game played among highborn children i think rickon was playing it with the walders with the walders yes yes so that's when he said it i was like how do where do i know that saying from oh yes i know how i know that saying it almost literally sounds euphemistic for sex as well it does yes yes it, yeah, okay. it does as well i agree and, and on that subject, so Peter Baelish has finally revealed his true colours towards Sansa, right? I mean, uh-huh. uh, there's not been another example of this. Uh, no, you're right. Check me here, McKelly. Yes. Th- this is the first time that he's actually actively kissed her or... Yes. Okay. We've always suspected. Um, and it's interesting that in the previous chapter, Lothar Brune saved her from Marillion, making similar advances, although but in Marillion's case, even less pleasant. Um, yes. But now she knows there's no hope of a repeat for that because Lothar Brune is uh, Peter Baelish's man. And so right. she's really on her own here. Um, yeah. But all that all that made me wonder, is it conceivable that Peter Baelish intentionally kissed her where they would be seen in order to set up the reaction from Lysa? I wondered the same thing because... It was very dangerous. First of all, she's a child. He shouldn't be kissing her, period. Well, yes, okay. But yeah. putting that aside, it is very dangerous to kiss her in such a public place when she is supposed to be his daughter. And Sansa notices plenty of people coming and going and watching yeah. her work. And yep. so he, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy to lose control and do something based on emotion spur the moment like that so yes i i had the same wonder that you did was it intentional to set up or to elicit a reaction from liza did he think she was going to go try and shove sansa out the moon door and that would give him an opportunity to uh, you know act instead push her out i don't know if he had it that far planned out but uh... if he did have it that far pr- planned out he waited a long time before he intervened to save sansa because she was on <laughs> yes. the edge yeah? she lost a shoe out the exactly. moon door 
<laughs> so the whole scene yeah. between Lysa Aaron and Sansa is pretty terrifying. There's an unstable person with unrestrained authority getting yes. angry with you and viewing an incident through their seriously distorted lenses. You're in big trouble. Rational argument isn't really going to help you in that case. Right. Um, and, and, and Lysa seeing Sansa as, as a sort of like another Catelyn is yes. kind of interesting because that's also what Peter Baelish sees Sansa as. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I, I see the, the the similarity there. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the the symmetry in in how they both view Sansa. Yeah, I I gotta say, what w- what would you pick here? Would you pick being accused of Lysa Aaron of stealing her man, or would you be for rather be accused of treason by Kim Jong Un? Huh. <laughs> right. <laughs> both are probably not going to end very well. No, this. no. And yeah. to our North Korean listeners, uh, we're, we're big fans. <laughs> <laughs> all of all of those listeners we have in North Korea. Uh, but, you know, it seemed to me like possibly Liza didn't actually see the kiss firsthand. Just let me to interject. Jenny didn't mention it in the summary, but Liza was one of the people who saw, who Kat saw watching her build the castle. Yes. So it is was. definitely possible she witnessed it. Physically possible, yes. She did She did have access to look out into the garden. But when Sansa looked up... Immediately after the kiss. Yes, she was not there. Now, she might have, might have seen the kiss, was aghast, and ran away. But it's also possible that she was told by someone else who did see it and maybe made up the story in her mind that it went the way she claims that it does, that Sansa was the aggressor. If she'd witnessed it firsthand, she would have still said the same thing. This is... This yes. Is a... Yes. I think you're right about that. Yes, I agree. So I wondered... So Marillion comes to get Sansa and leads her into the high hall and then tells the guards to stay out, closes the doors of the high hall and locks it with a really large spear. And I just wondered, what did Marillion know going in? Did he know that what Liza was going to do and he didn't want the guards busting in and when Sansa started screaming and make Liza look like a a horrible person trying to randomly shove this Mm. girl out the moon door why would he lock the doors like that unless Liza said when you come back I don't want anybody else in here lock those doors right I I, I, I'll I'll, believe me I'm happy to throw any door at Merlin's way but I'll give him that (laughs) If 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 Lysa said, go get Sansa, bring her back in here and lock the door when you come in, then that's what he would do. You know, he would absolutely do that. And one more thing I wanted to say about Marillion in this scene is I I wonder if he was so confused as to what was happening because he was in the high hall with Liza and Sansa while they were having this conversation. Now the description says he was at at the back of the hall, and I'm not quite sure how big the hall was, but I'll say when Roy Detrice was doing the audiobook version of this conversation, Liza was doing a lot of shouting at Sansa. Yeah, the point, and, and my imagination of any hall is that shouting would carry through a hall. Yes, and Liza does call Sansa Elaine some of the time, but also calls her Elaine, but then also says that her mother is Cat. No, and the cat that is Liza's sister. Now, Marillion knows Cat, yes. but thus far has treated Sansa like a baseborn girl. So you think he does not know the truth. And at one point, she outright calls Sansa. She says, Elaine or Sansa or whatever you call yourself. So uh, <laughs> he must have wondered why Elaine was kissing her father in a way that makes Eliza so upset in the first place. So uh, he must yeah. be like, what is happening? Now, at the end of the chapter, Littlefinger calls Sansa Cat's daughter, like directly in front of Marillion. But he also refers to her as Elaine. So all kinds of mixed messaging going on for Marillion. It's like, wait, so who are you? Who, yeah, yeah. who is this girl? <laughs> uh, all the more reason to kill him, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> You could have. She. He could have shoved them both out the moon door and been like, 
Marillion shoved Liza, and then I <laughs> so shoved Marillion. I shoved him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am a little bit surprised that Sansa argues so vociferously with Liza about Kat's pre-Ned virtue. Agreed. She's in big trouble. Don't pick <laughs> fights you don't need to fight. I mean, she wasn't there. Liza right. is right about that part of it. Now, Liza might be lying through her teeth, but pick your battles, you know? Yeah. You're trying yeah. to save your skin here. Even if the moon door isn't open yet, it's in the corner of the room waiting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she needed to just go along with whatever Liza right. said had happened before she was born. That sounds like mum. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm so sorry you had to deal with that. <laughs> When we were writing the script for this one, I noticed that in the last Sansa chapter, we said the words, Lysa doesn't appear to actively mean her niece harm. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't age very well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> uh, we just didn't want to spoil is all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will comment also on Marillion that his ability to gently sing along as a child is being pointlessly and mercilessly thrown out of a door to a 600 foot drop is quite that's quite stunning really i mean yeah he he's a true professional that one nothing (laughs) rattles him (laughs) he's gonna do his job no matter the circumstance (laughs) i'd also thank like to thank peter bailey for being for an entirely new experience of being glad to see him (laughs) yeah for once (laughs) but but you know what i thought about it and i wonder if i made the same joke in the uh, when he helped Sansa aboard the ship after Joffrey's demise. I might re- literally have said the same thing then as well. But coincidentally, that was then punctuated by him killing someone who was close to Sansa. So, you know, <laughs> yes. that's how this always ends, you know. Hey, yeah, I'm pleased is... to see Peter Baelish, who's for the chart. <laughs> Everybody ducks and covers at <laughs> <Yeah>. that point. <laughs> so your Tansy T speculation is finally and completely confirmed, right? Yeah, we get several long-awaited questions answered here, and that's yeah. definitely one of them. So, what what I'd like to ask you, just on a sort of like a sort of like you know a podcast thing, is why did you not see that as as spoiler? Because it felt like you were talking about things that were very hard to infer from what Hosta Tully was saying. I was basing it off of Cat's assumptions that she was making, and just okay. just kind of explaining what cat is talking about what 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 the some of the thoughts she was having what they meant I, yeah, so okay i tried not to go too far into the um you know the very specifics but i i was just giving enough that like this is what she's talking about this is possible alternatives of what she right of what she is suggesting is happening well, here. I, I'm not in any way criticizing. I was just curious. It just, it it felt like we sailed a lot closer to the spoiler wind than we normally do with that. <laughs> That's true. Yes. <laughs> I think I labored long and hard over whether I considered that too much of a spoiler or not. Yeah. But, uh, but, but so the full story becomes that Peter Baelish did impregnate Lysa while drunkenly referring to her as cat. Eesh. Ouch. Yeah, that stings. And then Hosta did make her have an abortion. It's brutal all round. Uh, and whilst yeah. it doesn't help, it is. We do know that that decision haunted Hosta to the end of his days, at least. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was. It was all he could think about in his final yeah. days. And so, just a quick refresher: what kind of what I was um, speculating on, maybe a little, <laughs> a little too much so at the time, was that Hoster. Was that, yes, Liza got pregnant. We we didn't say who because Kat had no idea who. We threw some ideas out there, one of which was Peter Baelish. Uh, but that Kat speculated that her father, Hoster, sold John Aaron on the idea of marrying the deflowered Liza by pointing out that she is clear, clearly fertile, which was a concern because John had no heirs to that point. So uh, that was kind of some of the thoughts she was having. And this also, it explains why Kat and Littlefinger have such different stories regarding him taking her maidenhead. Because... Oh, he literally thinks he did. 
Yes, he bragged about it, about taking both of the Tully girls' maidenhead to all of the Red Keep, and she insisted to Tyrion that they were never together. Huh. Now we see why uh. they have such different versions of the story. How interesting. I'd, I'd, not, I'd not put that together, but that is absolutely right. Yeah, so just to, just to spell it out, at the feast, he got drunk. He thought he was having a sexual encounter with Kat. It turned out it was Liza. Later, after his duel with Brandon, when he was once again laid up in bed, he thought he was taking Liza's maidenhead. But the previous time when he thought was Kat was actually Liza. Right, So right, right. he thought he was taking both, but it was Liza twice. You answered my unasked question, because I was going to say, why did he think he had both of them? Because he... That was why. Thank you. There you go. So mm-hmm. it's all but, coming a little clearer now. Right. But never mind that. We finally have our John Aaron murderer. We do. Ned would be so happy to know that this is finally solved. Let, let me just say, only a chapter ago, I was accusing new people of this. <laughs> Janice were... Slint, if you <laughs> remember. Right. You had some solid evidence. <laughs> yeah. Ned would have fallen for it. <laughs> but it was Lysa Aaron. Working on Peter Baelish's instruction. And let's be, just be clear about this. He didn't just provide her with the tears of Lise because she asked him for a way to remove John Aaron. He told her to do it for us. Air quotes around us. Right. So That's he was more than just a facilitator. He was, he at very least encouraged her in this idea, if not actually being the person to come up with the idea. Right. Yes. That's a That's an important distinction because... There there were reasons for her to want to kill her husband. Indeed. In, in, on her own, you know. But but this for us implies that she was being sold a bill of goods that then Peter and Liza can be together. And do you notice tears of... It's L-Y-S. Some people say Lys, some people say Lys. Tears of Lys, tears of Liza... You know, there's there's a list. Liza has come mm-hmm, some kind of mm-hmm. kind of similarly uh, named there. Yeah, but yeah. so I I thought real quick because it's been so long ago and there were so many twists and turns that I'd give a real quick refresher of the details of John Aaron's death and how it came about. By the way, we're three books in now, and John Aaron just died before these three books started. This has been a long running saga. That's why that's I was rushing to try and finish that uh, before we started recording today. I was like, OK, I have to read all this to make sure I got my facts straight. I think I got everything straight in my head here. So we start out with Stannis informing John Aaron of Cersei and Jamie's incest. John Aaron decides to foster Robert, little Robert, his son, Robert, with Stannis on Dragonstone. Liza, being obsessed with her son, has absolutely no interest in that happening. That's when Littlefinger uses her obsession for her son and her love for Littlefinger to get her to poison her husband. Pycelle recognized the tears of Lys being what was happening to Jon Arryn, but he figured the Lannisters did it. So he took over control of taking care of John Aaron and proceeded to let him die. Now you recall Hugh of the Vale, who was killed by the mountain in the uh, in the hands tourney. Well, Littlefinger had suggested to Ned that someone should talk to Hugh of the Vale. Uh, Jory tried. He wasn't very cooperative. So Ned thought he would try himself. But coincidentally, he died before Ned could talk to him. Varys suggests to Ned that Hugh was a possible candidate for John Aaron's murder. Administrator of the poison. Yes. And let's not forget the other half of this. Liza lying to her sister in a letter out of the blue that it was the Lannisters that killed John Aaron. Now, why would Littlefinger want to do that? Why not just let enough be enough? You know, John Aaron mysteriously died. End of story. Why do that? That's a little less clear cut, but I think most most people believe that 
Littlefinger is an agent of chaos. <laughs> right. And so he knew that Robert was going to go to pull, go call on Ned to be his new hand of the king. So this immediately uh, creates a issue between the Starks and the Lannisters because the new hand of the king is going to suspect the Lannisters of killing his father figure and former hand of the king, sowing trouble between the two. Yeah. And also, it it embroils him with Cat. Yes. To a certain yeah. extent. But but then I thought about that and then I immediately sort of discounted it because why didn't he go to Winterfell? Wouldn't you, if you wanted to see Cat, wouldn't you have argued for you being in that? I mean, a gazillion people went to Winterfell <laughs> right. in that first thing. Why not yeah. one more? I'm sure he could have said, I grew up with Cat. I'd love to, to yeah, see exactly. Catelyn Stark, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. But one thing I'll say is he can't truly have wanted to be with Lysa Arryn. I agree. Yes, I, I, I think that's absolutely true. He he wanted to be with Lysa Arryn because of where the the levels that it elevated him to. And I don't just mean uh, geographically. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll ask you, how calculated, uh, on the calculated to rash ometer, how calculated or rash was his decision to murder Lysa here. Yeah, right? So he, there's two options, right? He had planned to push her when he saw the opportunity, when he saw, oh, yeah, she's standing right by the the gates of the moon here. I can just, or, I mean, by the moon door, I can just give her a shove and out she goes. Or he decided when she opened her mouth about killing John Aaron and framing the Lannisters all on his instruction and thought, I can't trust this lady. I need to or shove her out this door. he decided while he was building snow castles with Sansa <laughs> that he would kiss Sansa in full view of his wife, precipitating a situation in which he would be able to kill her. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the truly calculated version of it. That is the, uh, the master uh, manipulator game right there, which yeah. he's pretty good at it. So, uh, yeah, you can't rule that out. The, the one thing is, I mean, all right, so looking at the rash side of it, he can pin the actual murder on Marillion, but then keeping yeah. the Lords of the Veil vale on side is going to be super difficult. Yes, it is. You know, yeah. I mean... They're already not happy that he is, you know, Liza's husband and Lord Protector right. of the Veil. Vale. Exactly. But now, I will say that part of it might be kind of altruistic. He might really want to protect Sansa. He loves Sansa in some ways, and... She was in real danger from Lysa. And so some of it might be that. I'll give him... Oh, I'll, I'll... yeah. I hadn't thought about that uh, that aspect of it. But yeah, maybe he thought she's going to end you, up killing you, you her. You don't really give Peter Baelish a fair crack, McKelly. That's the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. I rarely do. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the flip side of that, of course, is that he, he, he often chooses the riskier, more chaotic path. Right. I mean, John Arryn's murder, the letter to Cat, these are crazy turbulent things that don't need to happen yeah yeah that he's precipitating pushing Lysa out the moon door totally within those realms of that yeah Ly- lying about the dagger having been Tyrion's when it was uh, yeah exactly you know one not his one one piece of evidence I'll have for the on the calculated side is that he elevated Lothar Brune to captain of the guards of the Eyrie which oh, is yes. very convenient about now, because Captain the Guard would be presumably the one to investigate the murder, and he's going to conclude, yes, it was Marillion. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, I will say that putting your own man as Captain of the Guards is the kind of typical thing that your Varys's, your Tyrion's, your Peter Baelish's would do just for a rainy day. Right. But yes. it just happens to be very handy right this second. It does, I agree. I'll, I'll conclude by saying... Baelish is a bounder and a cad, and he deserves to be strung up for what he's just done. But if Marillion takes the fall, <laughs> I'll be okay with that, because he's the worst. Yes. It's terribly unfair on Marillion, but it will be satisfying. Yeah, he, there's a lot of things that he um, should have been in deep trouble for. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we we only got a little taste of it with Sansa last chapter, Chances are that wasn't a um, an isolated incident, so you know. Yeah, Sansa said that she u- he used his favoritism to act completely differently outside of Lysa's vision than within it. 
and right. basically he was so. conceited and arrogant when she wasn't around. Yeah. So there's he's probably being brought up on the wrong charges, but he's it's charge he should be brought up on charges regardless. So Yeah. All right, do you have some background for us? I do. I, I wanted to tell you all about another Aaron Regent who ruled the Vale in her son's name from the Erie. Shara Aaron was known as the Flower of the Mountain, and she was considered one of the most beautiful women in all of Westeros. And she was well aware of her beauty. In fact, when Aegon the Conqueror began his invasion of Westeros, Shara sent a portrait of herself to Aegon with an offer. That offer was that she'd agree to marry him if he'd agree to make her son Ronald his heir. Aegon, who already had two sister wives, passed on the offer, so it came to war. The Vale fleet earned a victory over the Targaryen fleet off the coast of Gaultime, but the victory was short-lived because, you see, the Targaryens have dragons. Mm, and, yeah. and big ones. Yeah. So Visenya Targaryen simply balanced the scale by burning the Vale fleet courtesy of her dragon, Vagar. Uh, when other kingdoms of Westeros began to fall to Aegon, Shara amassed a large part of the Vale force at the Bloody Gate, trusting that the gate would prove as impenetrable as it always had. Can I, can I just mention, as yeah. well as being able to burn ships, dragons can also fly. Yes, again, <laughs> dragons. <laughs> Instead of smashing a ground force against the Bloody Gate, Visenya once again simply, as you mentioned, flew over the gate, all the way to the Eyrie, right into this very courtyard where Elaine slash Sansa built her snow castle. Uh, and when Shaara returned to the castle, she found her son Ronald sitting on Visenya's lap. Uh, the boy innocently asked his mother if he could ride on Vagar with Visenya, and unsurprisingly... Sha'ara bent the knee then and there. And Visenya, being a good sport that she is, then flew little Ronald three laps around the giant's lance, which is the mountain that the Erie sits on. Uh, and when they landed, the boy went from king of mountain and vale to lord of the Erie and warden of the east. You know, Lysa would also have bent the knee in that situation. <laughs> yeah, Sha'ara maybe? and Lysa have something in common, I think. In comparison with the television show, Sansa is first joined by Robert in the Snowcastle scene. Uh, their scene is, for a while, quite friendly and affectionate. He talks of killing anyone she wants once she's Lady of the Vale. And Sansa oh. wistfully thinks that that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, <laughs> she's got a Arryn... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Robert, Ar <laughs> Robert Arryn then accidentally damages the castle. And that annoys Sansa. And then they argue and he stomps on the castle. And then she whoops him upside the face for stamping oh. on the castle. Okay. He runs away with the look of a child not used to censure. And then Peter Baelish joins Sansa. Sansa's worried about what she's done. He reassures her that it was overdue. Okay. Okay. Uh, Peter Baelish and Sansa then talk. He says that he killed Joffrey because Joffrey hurt Catelyn. And he oh. loved Catelyn. He then kisses her. She lets it happen for a second before pushing him off. Uh, Sophie Turner is taller than Aidan Gillen. So the, so the sense of the man molesting a child is somewhat obscured by that fact. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. We do see a figure in the background moving away. Uh, the moon door is open the whole time. And Marillion is dropped, sadly, not through the moon door, just from the <laughs> scene. <laughs> There's no mention of John Arryn or Tansy T. Uh, Peter Baelish pushes and see. Okay. Good stuff. Uh -huh. Penetry Corner. A couple of points. All right. Okay. While she's building the castle, it says that the wind makes the snow drift against the walls of her castle. Now, the walls of her castle aren't very tall, so this wouldn't be a very big snow drift to begin with. But right. uh, okay. in my experience, the type of snow that drifts is the dry, powdery type of snow. Yes. Not the large, snowflake clumping type that would be ideal for building a snow castle like Winterfell. Uh-huh. I'm with and you. And that heavy, wet, clumpy snow tends to fall without wind. Right. Okay. Yes. 
Furthermore, she's in an interior walled garden where the wind will be dampened by the walls. So the whole thing just doesn't quite hang together. It's either windy and drifty or it's wet and, you know, clumpy. Clumpy, right. It just feels like, you know what? This is not our first snow-related pedantry. I recall that as you were talking about it, I recall Uh we had previous snow pedantry. Where does George Moyer live? New Mexico? He does now. He grew up in New Jersey. But, oh, he uh, did. So he, he's aware of snow. He's just I just feel like he's a child of summer these days. You know, he just doesn't understand snow the way he ought to. <laughs> right. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> she built most of Winterfell and then dawn crept into the garden. How dark would it be in an <laughs> interior courtyard on a snow night? So no moon, no stars. In the mountains, it would be pitch black. It would be very dark unless there were some sort of torches or something providing illumination. Right. I, there would be some torches, but they would be on the peripheries and she's in the middle of the garden. I can't believe it. It feels like it would be like the bottom of a well where she was building this snow, this <laughs> when, castle. When the, when the sun finally came through, the castle was really just a bunch of clumps. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm this so was proud of prettier it. in my mind. <laughs> yeah, look, it's Winterfell. What, that big mound? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, Darkness. it just seems astonishing. I mean, because because it's hours of work. So she's working in the dark that whole time before dawn crept into the cloister, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get where you're coming from. I, I have a, a, ver- a little one which has a very possible explanation of coincidence, really. Go but on. She recalls early in this chapter that the older servants, the, the older servants telling her of the liveliness in the castle when, and I quote, her father and Robert were wardens of John Aaron. Right. It's the, it's the her father part. If, okay. if McKellie, not repeating you're someone you're else's forgetting. words. Yeah. You're forgetting. Sansa... Is Ned Stark's daughter? You just forget. I, that, I right? know it, it's, but if she weren't repeating someone else's words, she would say my father. Uh, she says her father and Robert Baratheon were word, uh, words of John Aaron. It's just the wording sounds like servants know her true identity, but supposedly nobody but Liza and Peter Baelish know. And like I said, could definitely just have been a coincidence that they mentioned how. Yeah, sorry that you're and, here and, and it's she's so boring. Talking Once about, upon a time, yeah, it was and she's exciting. also talking about my father in the sense of her father. You can think of yourself in the third person like that. Uh, yes, I it, get it's you. Little. It, 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 I can see why it would like trigger something, but I, I think yes. it's probably permissible. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's very possible explanation is just coincidence they brought up her father, but it's just the weird wording of not my father and Robert, but. Her father and Robert sounds like she was repeating someone else's words. That's all. So news and notes. We we had a really fun sustainer call uh, yesterday uh, with our uh, various sustainer levels, and uh, one of the things we did was we we McKelly and I did a personality test, and then we compared ourselves to the uh, to the characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, and it was very it was very interesting. I mean, not not particularly. I think I think mine was kind of like perhaps reinforcing some stereotypes. I was Tyrion Lannister or Peter Baelish. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of tracks, I'll admit it. Yours were more difficult to pin down though because yours yes. I don't know. A Marjorie Tyrell in the High Sparrow. Yeah, which is a character we haven't met yet in the story, but Right, yeah, but Marjorie yeah. have but I think I think we might reference that a few more times because there were some interesting things, you know, the the the, the coincidence of who Sansa is in the same box as is an interesting one. We yes, might, we might bring that up later on because it's uh, right. Because the thing is, to bring it up now, I feel like is a spoiler for where Sansa's character might go. Okay. Because right this second, Sansa is nothing like the person she's in the same character box as. Right, but, you, but when we said it last see. night, one of the sustainers, um, uh, T and Books, said, "No, no, they're very similar. They're like as if it was like, oh yeah, sure, they should be in the same box. But right this second, it doesn't feel like they should. So 
Yeah. We might bring this up yeah. later on. Yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. And, and did, I don't know if you've been on Discord today, but um, it came up in Discord that we were that we did that in last night's call, and a lot of several people had done it themselves to see. Oh, cool! What, I'll have a look at that. They, and see what they yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and speaking of our call last night, George C, who was on our call, um, we got to meet for the first time. Very nice fella. He was. I very much enjoyed his company. Yep. Last week, we mentioned that he joined us at the, I believe, Landed Knight tier. And since then, he has upgraded to the Small Council tier. So that is, I feel like that was worthy of a mention. Because that's, oh, sure. you know, really Absolutely. cool. Yeah. So thank you very I, I, much. I'm hoping he's not regretting his decision after last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we got a review on Podchaser.com from Coyel Rana 2006. Amazing podcast. I came across it accidentally on Spotify while searching for music to listen to as I read the books. Now it's my go-to podcast whenever I'm doing assignments or traveling. I It definitely elevated my reading experience as well. Oh, there you go. Actually, I feel like this episode has elevated my own reading experience, McKelly. Some of the things yeah. you said, like for instance, the fallen statue. I'd forgotten how the statue fell and who it was. Ah, okay. Well, yeah. glad I could provide that yeah. uh, reminder for you. And thank you very much uh, for... That review, Coil Rana. Coil Rana, I'm going to say. Coil yeah. Rana, <laughs> 2006. Thank you very much. That was a very, very nice review. Much yes, thank you. Uh, so let's conclude. So, all change in the Eerie. The Royces were in almost open rebellion against Lysa's decision to stay out of the war anyway. How are they going to uh-huh. react to the news now that she's dead and therefore Littlefinger is in charge? Uh, right. Does he salve their wounds by bringing them into the war? I mean, that's one thing you could do. If you say, now Lys is out of the picture, we can do what you wanted to do, Jan Royce. We can go to war. But on whose side? The Starks have basically lost, right? Right. Yeah. That would be... That'd be... be, It'd be fascinating to find out what they would do in that situation. Now, remember, he's supposed to be there in the Eerie to bring them onto the side of Tom and Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So... That's a, that is a he's a again. It feels like an agent of chaos thing. It's kind of like, all right, so now here I am. What the heck am I gonna do with this? <laughs> yeah, how am I gonna get around <laughs> this one? But you know, it does. Like you said, is Peter gonna climb another rung here? He, we've watched his progression. You know, going from master of coin to randomly wanting the title of Lord of Harrenhal, even though it's supposed to be an accursed title, which we now know. It was what he needed to have the stat, the stature in the realm to marry Eliza Aaron. Mm-hmm. And uh, now with her gone, he's surely planning on ruling in Robert's name, right? He's not going to be like, oh, I'm going to step aside and, you know, let whoever else might be uh, <laughs> more suited for this. Surely he's going to do that, step in and rule in Robert's name. Will the other Vale Lords allow it? They're already upset that he's Lord Protector of the Vale. And now he's not even married to Liza Aaron. He's not even married to an Aaron anymore. So, And he only was for uh, a few weeks. I mean, like, it's not right. like it was a, a, a husband who you didn't like who was at least a husband for 10 years, you know? Yes, right, right, right. He established himself as, right. you know, in that role. All of his shenanigans might be scuppered if Sansa doesn't back him. Sansa oh, has his right. life in her hands right this second. Now, could it could it work out theoretically? The guards come in, and uh, Littlefinger says it was Marillion. Marillion says it was Littlefinger, and Sansa says, "No, it was Littlefinger. I just watched it. It just happened right now." And the captain of the guards, Lothar Brun, says, uh, I saw that. I, I, it sounds like it was Marillion to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I know there was a problem between Elaine and Liza. You know, I, I think she's um, lying. Uh, I think Marillion and, and Sansa were in it together or something like that. Interesting. So, so, so that I hadn't really thought of that, that he, she, she has this potential to do whatever she wants here, but there is a lot more danger in pointing to Peter Baelish than there is to point oh, to yeah. Marillion. Yeah, there's no real danger in pointing to Marillion. You know? Well, apart like, from the fact that you've sided with Peter Baelish forevermore. Well, yeah, that's true. That is a dangerous thing that's to true. do, I feel. Yeah. 
And and again, just asking the question, does her playing in the snow connote her desire to get back to Winterfell and perhaps reclaim it for the Starks? Yeah, I spent some time thinking about that because like a good quarter of this chapter was describing her playing in the snow and mm-hmm. and her thought her feeling of snow in her mouth making her feel stronger like she's back in Winterfell the taste of Winterfell with the snow in her mouth and so much time and effort describing the construction of this castle and I thought why some piece part of me just thought George Martin was enjoying this seed you know playing yeah. in the snow as Sansa Stark and and I, I part of me just thought it was just showing that Sansa is still a child at heart you know she's she's yeah. caught up in all these high political espionage things and really she's just a 13 year old girl who enjoys yeah. building castles and playing in the snow and like you said she obviously misses home and longs for simpler times at home with her family and you know i think i think that's that was my thought on why we spent so much time watching her build a snow castle and play in the snow yeah. But as we said, it was the last named chapter in the book. We've come an awful long way. And next up, really we do have. have an we do have an epilogue, which you say here in the notes, in, we meet a new character who's also kind of an old character. So I am intrigued. Yes, you definitely don't skip out on the epilogue just because it says epilogue. All right, all you're right. definitely going to want to tune in and hear I'm sort of contractually obliged it. to not to. Oh, you mean the listeners, I see what you're saying. <laughs> the listeners, yes, okay. the listeners. <laughs> All right, there's four ways that you could help us. You could leave us a positive review, as Koyorana2006 did. Uh, you could buy merchandise at ghostsofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostsharrenhall. Join us at any of the various sustainer levels. There's a tier to match your budget and your interest, and you'll get to meet us and have fun with us. Uh, or you can just make a donation directly at our website, ghostsofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up on the latest Ghosts of Harrenhal news and developments, you can always check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Harrenhal, or on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.